thank you for your time and if we could give them a welcoming round of applause. Thanks. Well, so this this particular panel is looking at why um, why some of our local theaters here, some of them large and them mid-sized and them small, are, are wrapping their heads around this kind of work and why they're approaching it and what particular challenges and rewards there might be in in um, presenting and, and tackling work that has to do with the Middle East in some way. Um, and, and, and thinking about this, you know, just just today, and, and kind of almost so many days, the, the front pages of our newspapers are dealing with the Middle East in some way. It's driving our world, the, the issues that are playing out in the Middle East and the way that, they, the way that those issues resonate in this country. It, it seems to me that almost the question is not why are theaters tackling plays that are dealing with the Middle East, but how can you not be? Um, and yet there are some, you know, I think there's some real um, challenges and maybe some reticence that some theater producers have in tackling this kind of work and, and maybe for, for some real reason. And yet in the panel that we had just heard an hour or two ago when we were talking about challenges and the kind of risks that people are taking in, in presenting work that's dealing with issues in the Middle East, when you hear about, well, you know, my, my parents were taken to jail or, uh, you know, this person had his fingers crushed by the police or, you know, you've been shut down because the censors have come in and stopped the play. I, I think the whole context of risk is maybe brings up, there's a kind of different, a whole different dimension that we're talking about. And yet, nevertheless, um, those challenges and, and those yeah, risks are, the are real and probably the rewards are real too. And so we're going to be hearing from um, the artistic directors of four very different kinds of theaters here in the Bay Area um, about why, they're, why they are um, taking the risks to, to, to um, present this kind of work, what are the particular challenges around um, presenting it, approaching the work, preparing your audience, following up with your audience, getting the right artists on board, and, and how are they planning maybe to continue to do this work in the future? So that's just kind of kind of setting a context for um, what we're looking at. One of the other things that we heard from this morning with Dr. Debashi was, you know, he quoted the San Jose Mercury News and he was, you know, mentioning about the cycle of tragedy and, and the way that that sort of, it, it, it's a stereotype and it sort of marginalizes the experience of the Middle East. And it seems like perhaps for those of us who are not of Middle Eastern descent, the, the Middle East, we understand it in, in kind of frames of enormity. Um, there's an enormity of tragedy, which was you know represented in that comment from the San Jose Mercury News. There's sort of an enormity of, of hope and inspiration that I think many of us around the world are seeing in the Arab Spring. There's sort of an enormity of, of intellectual and, and faith foundations as the three great monotheistic religions, religions followed by billions of people across the world come from this place. And all of the, all of the sort of wonderful acts of compassion and humanity and terrible acts of war and violence that spring out of all of that these frameworks of enormity that maybe those of us who are not of Middle Eastern descent look at the Middle East, and that's our framework. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing today and that the works that these four companies have presented is ways that we are able to understand the Middle East, yes, with those lenses, yes, inside of those frames, but inside of those frames are idiosyncratic, individual human beings with lives of their own. And it's providing us with a way of understanding the world, understanding the people in the world, understanding the people in this country um, in a way that, that reveals the full humanity and not a stereotype of a hero, not the stereotype of a victim, not the stereotype of a prophet. And I think that I'm, I'm really interested in, in maybe exploring some of that aspect of the conversation today as well. So um, I think what I would do is, we've, we've heard the names, but I think some of you will know these companies really well, and some of you may not know these companies much at all. And so I'm not going to make any um, sort of assumptions as to whom you know and whom you don't know. So I'm just gonna ask, moving from my left, if, if, the, if these um, artistic directors could say a little bit more about their theater and a little bit more about the work that they're going to, that they 
we'll be referencing this in the conversation. Some of it's been in the past, and some of it's still coming up. So, Carrie. Hi, uh, I'm Carrie Perloff. Uh, I'm the artistic director of the American Conservatory Theater, um, which is a producing organization and also a school. Um, and uh, uh, I was just thinking about how, 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 sort of this material and that so mostly what I have learned in my years at ACT is from our students. And one of my favorite students is an actor named Omar Metwali, who graduated quite a few years ago now, but it was with Omar that I started the quest of looking for Middle Eastern plays. And um, the play we're going to talk about today uh, from our end is a play by Wajdi Maud called Scorch, S on B, which was written in French, um, but he's Lebanese and premiered in Montreal, and we did um, last season at ACT. Good afternoon. You guys wait. Yeah. yeah. It's just so big in here. <laughs> um, my name is Sean San Jose. I uh, work for a place uh, here in San Francisco called Intersection for the Arts, and very specifically, I work with the resident theater company Campo Santo, and um, we create uh, all new work. Have for more than 15 years uh, doing that, and I, I suppose if we're going to talk specifically about a, a, a piece of work. Um, uh, there's a young writer that we work with uh, by the name of Sharif Abu Hamdeh, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, when we conversate about things, uh, I think the individual storyteller and personal history becomes very important to the way that we approach any topic or any question. Um, I'm Marissa Wolf. I'm the artistic director of Crowded Fire Theater, and um, we're a indie theater. We do um, new work. And um, we've been around for 15 years. Um, and we really um, work with playwrights uh, commissioning, developing, and, and producing the work. Um, and in particular, our first Middle Eastern play was just done this summer um, by Jonas Hassan Kamiri, who is um, Swedish Tunisian. And um, that's called Invasion, and directed by the one known every night. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Michael Butler, um, Artistic Director of Center Rap in Walnut Creek, or as technically it's in the Bay Area, but I think it was on the ninth ring of Saturn. <laughs> it's so far out there. Um, Center Rap is a resident company of the Lecture Center for the Arts, and interestingly, we are a city program, so I'm really here representing Parks and Rec, which is technically <laughs> what I am. Um, we have no tradition of doing uh, even new plays, let alone uh, Middle Eastern plays, so uh, we are producing and directing uh, Yusuf al Gindi's, the wonderful playwright who's worked with see this afternoon, uh, Pilgrim's Musa and Sherry in the New World, which just won the Steinberg Award. Uh, we're doing that as part of our Off Center series in the spring. Um, and so this is, I'm just on the beginning of my adventure into the, this world, and I'm really happy to be here because it's going to be a very uh, great learning experience for me this whole weekend. Um, so thank you for that. I, and I think what I'd like to do is, you know, rather than like interview Carrie and then interview Sean and then just moving down the line, I'd like to kind of throw out the questions and then ask, you know, make sure that each one of them is responding, but kind of hopefully create a, a conversation that's also here, occurring here at this table. And then we will move on to the next question and the next question, then we'll wrap up um, that portion of it around 205, 210, and make sure that we've got plenty of time for Q&A, and also just to hear from your experiences and thoughts around this in a good 20 to 25 minutes of that towards the end of the session, so just to kind of lay that out. The first question that I, we had in front of us as we were looking at it is like, you know, why do this kind of work? And, you know, maybe it's because it's on the front page of the newspaper, but maybe there's something else. So maybe, Carrie, you were mentioning that it came you know, from someone that you, from a student at, in the MFA program. And maybe, Maybe talk a little bit more about Well, the question you asked is really the better question, which is why not? Right. You know, we, we spend our lives, we're just talking about this, you know, having discussions about diversity in the American theater, which usually means the same three plays and the same three cultures. And, you know, this represents an enormous part of the world. It's amazing to me that it's taken us this long. But theater always grows out of individual relationships. Um, you want to work with specific artists. They lead you to other artists. People tell their own stories. I started my career as an archaeologist in working on ancient Middle Eastern stuff. So, you know, I, I studied Sumer and Babylon and Assyria, and I love that part of the world. Um, I came back to it through lots of different people, but starting with Omar, and got to, I, I work in Canada a lot, and heard about this playwright um, who had uh, come from Lebanon when he was 18, 
And so I went to Montreal and started looking for these plays. He's written this tetralogy, so there are four of them, and they get weirder and weirder. I mean, they are really surreal, dangerous plays. Um, but uh, Scorch just knocked me out. I mean, it's, it's a Greek tragedy by the Middle East about twins um, searching for their identity, and it was made into quite an amazing film, actually, last year. Mm -hmm. um, and once I met him, at Washi, who's a very magical, particular kind of writer, I just, I just wanted to sort of keep going down that path. And I'm sure one of the things we'll talk about, it depends on, you know, if we're talking about plays written in English or not, translation is a big issue, a really interesting question, um, and how you find translators for, for work from all over that part of the world right. um, uh, is particular. But, but this one really captured my imagination, and I brought it back to ACT, and we have a trustee who's Lebanese, um, Lila Tariff, and this meant a great deal to her, and we started to just read more and play, and more and more people. It's a big community here, you know, as you start to put the feelers out, more and more people come into the mix and say, that's part of my story, and you should make sure you know this, and you should talk to that person, and then you start casting, and there's a huge pool in this country now of Middle Eastern actors. So I was really committed to that, um, to making sure that around the table was a, a, a Kind of rich world. So there was an Egyptian actor and an Iranian actor and a Syrian actress and uh, a Lebanese actress and a Greek guy. And yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of translation, Marisa, that makes makes me think of the Invasion, yeah. which was originally written in Swedish. Right. Yes. Right. So right. It's, tell us a little <laughs> yeah. bit about that yeah. process well, um, and journey. Yeah. So um, Jonas. Um, well, actually, this is funny because I, I actually uh, heard about this work from um, reading an article in the New York Times about, it, you know, the title was something about, like, you know, potently political playwright. Like, yes, who is this? And um, uh, and uh, he'd only been done in the U.S. once, in New York. And so we were really excited to be able to do his work here. And he was incredibly, I mean, he's, I think, where's he living, Evan? Like, England or? Between Sweden and Paris. Right, okay, Sweden and Paris. So um, he was very, very open with us um, about sort of, yes, make it your own and do what you want. And um, the translation, so he speaks uh, fluent English, but he chose to have it translated by an American um, writer. Um, and he talked about that as being important for him so that it kind of carried that because it's, it's an incredibly um, uh, relevant, like of the moment, um, piece that ha that really uses the kind of like vernacular and slang of, of the characters in the world. And he felt like, um, he said that he, he felt it would um, be a bolder translation if he didn't do it himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I think that he has a very close relationship with this writer who also has in one of his novels. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because in our audience we had a, uh, I was so startled that we had not only um, a great representation of um, folks from the Middle East, um, come out, but also folks from Sweden mm -hmm. um, who were Swedish speakers and had been reading his work and were really excited to see it stage. Great. So, Sean, what, what brought you, I mean, I know that a lot of what you do is based upon the relationships that you develop with the artists. Um, and is that true? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting. And thank you, Toronto, for having, having this particular panel of folks. I think in creating work, especially new work, you know, for us it's always trying to reflect the world that we live in. And so there's kind of a, a non-specificity to that. And I think there's obviously this whole, these past few weeks have been filled with people clearly working from the inside. If we look about this subject matter, we're, we're, we're clearly working from the outside of it in terms of that. I mean, I think it's just part of the, um, each of us, it's the United States, right? So each of us has to cleave our place into the, the storytelling map or narrative that this country allows at a certain point. And so just like any other movement, I think um, we're, the, the world has to wake up and it's just gonna have to tell more and more stories that way. So we've certainly never went into it thinking, um, what we tell a, a, a Middle Eastern story, we're not capable of that. I think also our expertise, if we have one, is not in looking at things politically, per se, or historically in, in that sense. So it has to become very personal, and the personal then hopefully can be political in that sense. 
And, um, and so it, it's interesting, I guess, just to sit up here and, and try and um, invert the, the equation of how we approach it. Because oh, if, if, if the heart of any of the storytelling, like Brad was saying, is the, the human experience of it, um, that's what we want to start with. And then I think I'm a believer in the more specific you make the storytelling, oddly enough, the more um, universal it becomes. And I think, um, in our case, working with this, this young man, uh, Shari Abu Hamde, he, he worked with us for a long time, and he saw how other writers told stories about their own past, their own histories, their own memories, their own struggles. Um, and it's also hard for us to be representative of international things, us meaning our group, Campo Santo, which is very squarely grounded in San Francisco, frankly, and grounded in being the strange citizens of this United States, which ends up having a lot of swimming through a sea of several different migrations. And I think in seeing these sort of paths and seeds of other people's works, whether it's Chicanos or black folks or uh, Japanese, whatever it is, if you, if you, however you got to the place that you got to, and I think he saw uh, his own story and his own past in that. He's Palestinian, so I think that also has a, 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 a there's something heightened in that for him in terms of, of homeland, history, identity, all that. I mean, in a weird way, I sound so general about it, but I think that that moment that you sit in a theater, especially if you, you grow up in the United States, and for many of us, you don't see yourself reflected often enough. I think the moment that you see yourself reflected in any kind of refraction, where you go like, listen to that, listen to that, that August Wilson story about this guy telling a very particular story in the 1940s, but it's about his grandmother. I relate to my grandmother in that same way, if this is not too much of a stretch of, I mean, that's the kind of the moment that I had that makes me interested in, in doing theater. And I think for us, Sharif had that story, and so he came into it in many different ways, trying to tell stories, and ultimately the strongest story he had was to tell a story about him and his father and his mother in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think we, you do that, and then you put it in the hands of the people that, that know that story the best, and interestingly enough, um, Omar Metwali um, is also part of our company as well as, as Terry's, and he, um, he directed that, and I think there's something, there's something this cool about the growing legion of stories that this country is filled with, and the fact that these two younger men were able to lead us, a company, still very young ourselves, but into a new era of, of storytelling. And that's why I, I'm most excited to be on the panel, it's actually the, the part where we get to look out and go like, and, and what else? And what other stories are there? And what other stories are there? When we first started the thing, we did a play by a guy, Octavio Solis, and if you would categorize him a Chicano writer, and so I think it's easy to go like, oh, there's a Chicano plays. I think we very purposely set out to tell stories that reflect the world we live in. And, and you know, if you live in the Bay Area, that's a lot of stories. So we're never going to get to uh, one hundredth of them, but the ones that speak the truest and the loudest are, are, are the ones we want to be part of telling. And Shari knows that story. So I think it's less that his play is more about his voice and, and, and the voice that he's in as a part of the generation of, of people. It's just, it's a weird, it's a weird, you know, bottom of the mountain thing that we're all in in theater. Because we're trying to tell many, many stories for many, many people. And the way that the United States works is the, most of the land is already plotted out to people. So it takes these waves for people to go, oh, now they're getting lesbian stories. Oh, no, black folks can tell the stories. Oh, no, Latin people can tell the stories. Oh, no, Asian American folks can tell the stories. So I feel sort of oddly fake up here. So to go <laughs> <laughs> now we tell Middle Eastern stories. I, don't, I, I could never report that we do that. I think we work with people that live in this world pretty honestly, and if you broke it down, yeah, Shadi is Palestinian, born in Lamar is Egyptian, so in that way, yeah. But he ended up, he told that he wrote this play, this first play that got produced called Habibi, and so beautiful and so honest. 
I don't think it could be in any 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 play festival or book about you know immigrant experiences or Middle Eastern experiences as far as I could tell because it moved me in that way. Great. So Michael, I, I am interested in asking you this question because you're you're going out on this limb for the first time and as you were saying it's not really something that you're it's usual for a center rep to be doing and so maybe and talk to us a little bit about how you found you know, this play and why and why now you said it was here maybe yes. There it is. Um, yeah. You know, in some ways, the the risk for us is not so much doing a Middle Eastern play, but in doing a new play. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a good thing in a way. But uh, that's in some ways where the, the bigger focus and it, it is on. Um, you know, we we launched this. It's part of this off center second stage program that we inaugurated three years ago because I was really feeling the need to, to have an opportunity for, my, for myself, frankly, and for our audiences to, you know, entertain and you know, come in contact with new work and uh, work that doesn't have to be as, frankly, just as sell as many tickets as, as I have to upstairs. So, um, you know, it was a little crazy to do that in 2009, but I thought, I thought it was a really good opportunity at the same time. Um, and did it without any budget or staff, and you know, sort of has to pay for itself. So it's a really interesting, it's still kind of a commercial venture in a weird way, but definitely um, the focus is to, to do new work. Um, the play came to me because I don't have a literary department, actually, so it's always like a weird, sort of personal recommendation based kind of um, way that it happens. Uh, David Pichat, an, an actor in Seattle that I worked with, many times now a playwright, uh, had encountered this play, I think with the festival, Lisa, for the Icicle, is it called? Yes. And, uh, you know, I talk, you know, we all, we talk to people all the time, like, what's good, what's good, do you have any recommendations? Uh, and he recommended it, and he just loved the play, and, and he really spoke to me about it as a beautiful new play, rather than a Middle Eastern play. Uh, and, and I responded to it as a, as a great play. Uh, but frankly, also feeling that Having an opportunity to have a conversation about this issue felt extremely important to me. And that anything that could uh, let people, even, even if they don't have a conversation, but just think about, you know, the developing empathy and understanding for uh, this, this situation was really important. And I like the place so much because um, it's basically a romantic comedy. Uh, that uses that genre and that powerful, you know, attractive story uh, to explore the a kind of culture clash between uh, the, the expectations and uh, between the American and Middle Eastern values. Uh, so it was appealing to me on a lot of levels, um, and that's basically what led to where I am now. What's so interesting is that I mean. And Truly, I'm asking this question for the first time. We did not like, you know, all meet on the phone and rehearse what we were going to say before we got here today. So all of these questions are, are for real. Um, they're not rhetorical. And so I'm, I'm really hearing them, which is really interesting and maybe really gratifying that I, I'm not hearing from any one of these four artistic directors that was like, gosh, we really felt like we needed to do something Middle Eastern, so let's go find something. It was, a, I mean, I'm really hearing that it's about these stories, these playwrights, this, uh, we want to reflect the world, and this is obviously a huge part of the world, so well, why wouldn't we do it, as Carrie was saying. And that's just really, I think that's really interesting, and yet, or maybe, a, and along with that, as you found yourself going down this path, and given, you know, the, the sort of, the, the complex histories of the Middle East, and the passions, and the volatility, and frankly, some of the sort of history that's been out there with, you know, I'm, I just so remembered, and I did get a chance to see it in, in New York. My name was Rachel Corey, and I think we all saw what happened with that, that company in New York, and you know the decision to pull the play for a while, and then they got beat up for that, and then they did it, and just like, there's, there were our unseen, perhaps, landmines, and I wondered if you, I wonder if you um, found any landmines along the way, or were afraid of any, or, or weren't afraid, or just sort of, just, just went full steam ahead? I, I don't know, is there something, different about this practice kind of work or, or not? I think there will be for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, any new play is going to 
have its set of challenges that will winnow down the, the possibilities. You know, title is so important, and I really like the title, but, I, but it's, it's, it's long. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this before, you said, right? Um, I mean, I, once you've read the play, I think you really love it. But, uh, you know, so I, I think it, it will, the, the goodwill and the natural ambassadorship of this play will, that takes a little longer, but I really believe it's going to have a, a potentially a profound effect on you, the people that see it, and, we'll, and will spread and will do its little part, you know, to, to change how people, not, not, not how they really believe or think, but affect some sense of their regard of things. I'm, you know, it's interesting, we didn't have any landmines, um, but, um, I'm saying that there's, um, it's such an important question to, to always be asking ourselves is like the sort of the question of quote unquote authenticity of voice and what that means as a you know white Jewish um, artistic director to be um, very thoughtful around and not and be aware of what can be easily cultural appropriation or what has been in our history of this country cultural appropriation as we as we do work by all sorts of folks who are not our own subject position. Um, and so I feel very grateful for um, uh, Tarange and Golden Thread's support and Evren because um, we just, I think that in our leading up to, in our pre-production of, of the show, um, we had a lot of conversations and a lot of, um, you know, just, we had to be really honest and open with each other about casting, about choices around, um, you know, having a resident artist from Proud Fire who has played a Middle Eastern um, a character before in a, a number of different times, but who himself is not. Um, what that meant, you know, and, and just being open about it and not kind of coming to the table like, well, listen, you know, um, I know everything, so I'm going to do this play. Um, and that feels very important but for, for all sorts of work that we do and, and not to sort of shut the doors and say, like, well, I can't do anything outside my own subject position because that's scary and that would be appropriating, but also to sort of say, when I do, um, Let's be thoughtful and ask a lot of questions and engage in ways that feel scary and important. Anything different for you, Sean? No, I mean, I, I think landmines don't they usually come around political issues or manufactured cultural issues? So I think no, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I think it also speaks to. It's easy for me to say because I believe it and because what we do is like we're interested in telling stories that reflect our world, which is sort of safe in a certain way. But that can only exist if there are then groups like Global Fred. Like in order for us as a whole ecology of us trying to tell stories, we actually need we need both of the muscles working at the same time. So therefore it becomes easier for me to sort of say like Yes, of course, that's another story in the sea of stories that needs to be told and at the same time. It's just like our identity. The same time that I say, I'm a person of color, I'm a person of color, I'm a person of color. And then at certain times I have to be like, shut the fuck up. Can't be always talking about, how I'm a person of color, I just have to be a person at a certain time. I think for the whole storytelling that ha has to happen for us as whatever, community, society, the world. And so, for us, we kind of have the we have the easier task of we're telling a story that is an honest, heartfelt, honest, imaginative, crazy story. But like landmines, it's very lightweight shit. It's very lightweight if someone doesn't want to play. I think that they're. I think it's harder if you're taking on something political, and it's obvious in this, you know, the culture that we live in that Middle Eastern things have a sort of this layer over it right now. So I think it's obviously harder for people and it's harder in a smaller degree for people that are, are attacking that a little more head on. So for us, no. no. Carrie. I'm laughing looking at John Holden and thinking about landmines. <laughs> My first year here doing the Pope and the Witch and getting practically arrested by the Catholic Church. So the Middle East was so easy compared to the Catholic Church. <laughs> Where I've, I've never in my life been picketed and attacked and bombarded as I was by that play. But we had fun, right, Joan? That was a landmark. Um, you know, and it was because it was sort of deliberately provocative. I mean, you know, it's um, 
so deeply depends on the play. A lot of these are family plays, you know, and family is family. It's hugely particular, you know, whether it's a Greek family, a Jewish family, a Turkish family, and an Iranian family, and the circumstances. Of, I'm thinking about Mona Mansour's work, or, you know, it's both very particular, both universal because it wrestles with um, um, intercultural um, and intergenerational issues that we all wrestle with, you know. Um, Good writing is sort of good writing. I, you know, um, the landmines are just as as Marissa says. I, you know, if we had done Scorched and just cast like our company, yeah, that would have been terrible. Um, and but you know, I always think the fun of making theater is every play you do, whether it's as a writer or a director or producer, is like a journey into an unknown world. So the best thing you can do is say to people who know that world, you. Take me, guide me. What do I pack? What do I eat? What show me? How does the language work? Who do you want to go with you? So, so every journey is is like that, and you you learn.
it's just like Harry said, then you go out, the one day you wake up and you go, uh-oh, I better cast some Middle Eastern actors in the United States, and then you put yourself to that task and go, oh, it turns out there's two million of them. <laughs> okay, great, like, I shouldn't trip about that. That's gonna happen. I think for all of us that live in, in boxes or get put in boxes, you know, the more and more we bust out and say, oh, there's actually a million stories about a million people and a million people can tell their stories. So let's do the really good ones and the ones that really need to be heard by people. And that continually is, is, is a process that hopefully we go through each time we do it, whether it's with Shari, or the Tango, and Zuko, you know, whoever you're working with, right? I mean, we work with, with, with uh, new writers, so, or writers that write new pieces. So. Yeah. so Michael, as you're ramping up, and as you're ramping up your audiences for, for this production, are there different or new things you, you're planning to do, or worrying about or hoping for as this approaches? I'm actually looking forward to not doing that and letting the audience sort of encounter the play. Uh, really pressing on, on its terms. But it but it is gentle. The, the play is gentle in that way. And like Terry said, you know, good writing is good writing. Right. And you're immediately aware that you're in the hands of a good writer, you know, it's inventive and has humor and heart and surprises and um, and, and and then you know character and relationships. I mean great characters, a very engaging relationship that begins to develop. But, but that draws anybody in. Um, and then all the other stuff is is sort of in support of, of that, or that's driving it, that's, that's driving it. So I, I think it's kind of great in a way to, to not come to this particular play to, to see a, you know, a story about maybe uh, a culture crash. Right. It's, it's, it's a story of, like uh, the doctor said in the keynote this morning, you know, the, 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 the bilingualism that is kind of willfully happily deliberate, or I wasn't quite good, wasn't deliberate, but some kind of really joyous embracing of this new adventure. And, and it's, a, you know, it's a story of um, this Egyptian immigrant trying to encounter America and make it here, and who uh, can you know, relate to that? That's dig deep enough, that's everybody's story. Yeah, I mean, I think what's so interesting that I'm hearing from the panel is that there's not, a, there wasn't a particular sort of Foreboding about approaching this work necessarily, um, and there and there wasn't really an experience of landmines, as people were saying along the way, or of even a kind of particular way of taking the audience by the hand and and having to sort of like usher them through or shepherd them through in, in a different way, which is I, maybe not what people assume in in, in protect practitioners here and elsewhere around the country, which is I think also really. Encouraging. Um, with that in mind, this might be a good time to kind of open it up and, and, and extend the conversation out to, to you all for both questions and, and, and comments and, and maybe sharing of your own experiences with this, with producing work um, that deals with issues in the Middle East or coming from the Middle East. So, do we need microphones? Yes. Go to them. Thank you so much. I am Fabia. I'm from Syria. I would like first to thank you for all the effort you are doing to uh, produce uh, the theater play. I I have a question that if you follow uh, the the image or the plays, uh, they were before uh, the Arab Spring and after the Arab Spring. Uh, from what we have read in articles, the news and most of the production or anything written about the Arab, you find uh, something has changed, the perspective <coughs> has changed. I have noticed that uh, the appreciation and respect for uh, Arab people or the Middle Eastern people have changed. So do you think uh, that uh, has affected your vision or even your audience? How that affects your job? Did you start to pick different subject and uh, do you think, as I, I don't know if I'm right, but I have uh, seen that even the theme itself in the play, I find a lot of things speaking about, for example, before 
the repression of women, how much their religion affects women, how they see us in general. And suddenly I have found a lot of politics came up and start to see another uh, thing happening in that area. So do you think that affects you? Have you noticed that? And your audience, how they receive this? sort of new generation, like a youthfulness, a hunger, and a, a, a kind of um, on the world stage, um, that I think, I feel at some level that there, that we need to be kind of pushing actually a demand for more um, Middle Eastern work on stages, um, and, and, you know, again, a nod to Tarant for her work and her um, vision that is pervasive here, but for me, it, it's, I don't know, it kind of brings up a sense of like, um, this should be a, a directive for all of us actually. That it, yes, 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 it's the stories and it's the relevant, blah, 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 but it's also, it's pressing. Like it's so immediate and important to all of us, um, particularly in the, in the world of the Arab Spring. I mean, I think it's a great question because it's a great question for us in the world, right? And I think is practitioners or creators of theater pieces were like witnesses, some form of witness and, and journalist of, of sort. So <laughs> with us, it's, even, it's like that times three in terms of its delay. Like an event will happen, it takes like three years for it to land into our consciousness about how it affects our culture. And then we can start responding creatively to further the dialogue in some way. So. I think to, to initially answer your question, for sure, for sure, yeah, I think every one of us in the world it feels a little bit more like that since, since, since all of the, the events have happened. Um, and then how will that affect the work? I, 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 don't, I don't know yet, too, because in the United States we're so like, you know, we look down at our own thing so much, it's gonna be hard to sort of go like, well, look back up, child, and there's the rest of the world, and how is that going to affect you all? And so I don't know how that's going to affect the, the rest of the, the way we tell stories. Um, I would imagine, too, it'll happen quicker in, in movies and TV, right? Wouldn't you think? I would think that'll... No, no, I, you know, because what you say is exactly... I mean, it's in the zeitgeist, and sometimes we don't even know what's in the zeitgeist. We hear it, we read it, we don't even really consciously know this is something we're thinking about, and then you read something and you think, that's what it is. And, uh, you know, for me, one of the most puzzling things about studying the Middle East is to try to understand tribalism. What, what is that? What does it actually mean to look at this Alawite, Sunni, Shiite situation in Syria, which you, it's in your DNA, and all we can do is parse it in the New York Times and try to understand what is that? Um, because we ostensibly live in a culture that is a culture of um, law. So, so uh, what Washti was trying to do in Scorched, I suddenly realized, was this question about vendetta. So how does vendetta work, right? Why is vendetta such an ancient thing? And why does it follow tribal law lines? And why, um, it, where does the law intersect with it? Which is, of course, what Greek tragedy is about. And, I was going to say, is that what Electra is dealing with? Yeah, so yes. I love this stuff, because that's what I was weaned on. But, but what I realized in talking to Washi, you know, he, he also loves Greek tragedy because the question that the Greeks tried to ask, and you know, we as Americans are so naive, we think if you just let people have free elections, democracy's gonna happen. We somehow don't get it. But you look at our own democracy, why don't we get what a, a messy, difficult process it is? But we don't seem to get it. And so, you know, this question of, of whether vendetta and tribalism can actually be interrupted by something that has a different kind of representation is, is huge. And the question of women, of course, is even huger because, uh, you know, for much of the Middle East, women have so much less access to voice and education. So, you know, I think those things, um, that's what drew me. I mean, the, 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 if you want to look at the sort of bigger political things that Irish people were writing about, I, I would love to work more on that because I, I, it's, so, it's so hard to wrap our heads around. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Terry brings up a great point too, though. Obviously, the, 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 the breaking down of walls and the hope of that is beautiful to all of us. And then 
then it butts up against sort of our theories around law and structure and, and, and anything messy, obviously, it becomes much more difficult. Like, there should be a million stories right now kind of running constantly about Gaza Strip and Mexico right now. Isn't that where the most contention and, you know, actual real life drama has been going on for years and years and years? And we can barely read it in the newspaper. So in order for it to get into our stages, it's harder. But I agree too, again, with Perry, that it's in the air, so it's going to, sooner or later, it's going to pull back down and it's going to come into someone's story. Political stuff is hard, but you right. I mean, I'm talking to an audience of people that know that much better than I, so it becomes very, that's where the landmines is, and, you know, it becomes an interesting thing. Hope, hope, hope becomes a beautiful thing. Uh, may I ask a question? So I just want to shift the conversation a little bit and focus on, uh, you've talked about uh, international, you know, Middle East as an international concept, and work in translation, uh, but, but uh, Habibi is, a, is an American story, and Pilgrims is an American story. Um, I'm interested in your perspective on why more Middle Eastern American plays are not being produced, and how can we help uh, to make that happen? <laughs> Sorry, it's not a baby. You knew I There's was a baby over there. What do you want me to do? I, I think that's the. Um, I will put myself to that task too. Um, I don't know. There's not enough space. I think part of it too is like again, like working two muscles at the same time. Like we can over here look at the big scope. What are the what are the stories? What is the world telling us to do? And then there needs to be enough rattling in the cage to be like tell her. Can you tell our fucking story? Can you tell our story? Can you tell our story? We're here. Can you tell our story? Okay, you're not going to tell our story. We're going to tell our story. And then we get like 50 of those stories. You go like, she's really good. I'm going to tell her stories next if she'll tell her story. So part of it, I mean, we have to work in this kind of unconscious concert together. Where you go like, will you continue to write and tell your stories? And then at the third stage, we'll tell those stories together. I mean, I don't think, well certainly none of us up here are situated in a place that says, let's focus on this as the type of storytelling. I mean, it's the, the thing with any, any, any group, any uh, minority, right? We have to, we have to speak loud enough until you listen to us. And if you're not going to listen to us, then we're going to speak louder. Or, or we're going to tell it to each other. And when we're going to tell it to each other long enough, that you're going to come in, you're going to become interested after a while. But I would just hope more, I mean, it's not like it's not happening. I mean, we take our cue from you. I think we reorient every year. There's, you know, many, many voices every every year. So, um. I think about, you know, what drew me to, you know, do this and, and you know, the, the, the component of, I mean, it sounds so, Sounds corny. Maybe it's naive. I don't know. But the you know, the love and understanding that, is, that the play has and it's calling for. Uh, you know, maybe that's maybe that's subversive on use of part to like make us think when we encounter this play. I mean, we watch it. That, oh, this is just a play about young lovers trying to make it. And then oh no, it's actually got all this other stuff. But not I'm hooked in on this very human story. Maybe that's. I don't know the answer to your question, why there isn't more. I, I'm not qualified to answer that, but, but well, just thinking about my own experience of why I chose this play. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, you know, most of the American theater does the same three plays. You get Middle Eastern plays, you talk about plays about women or anything, you know. It's a, I think you've done an amazing job. I mean, I think it's about getting names out there over and over again so that people start to get familiar with the array of possibilities, you know. I think. People don't read plays anymore in this you, you know what I mean? You send some, an artistic director play, you're lucky if anybody ever reads anything. I don't know why. So it has to do with keeping that pot boiling, as you have, as artists, as actors who want to do those plays, our ambassadors, and say, you want to work with me? Here's a play I want to do. I mean, very often that's how a play gets done. All kinds of different cultural plays. And somebody you trust says, read this, you know, and of the... 3,000 plays sitting on your desk, you read that one because that person, you know, and so partly just you, you know, um, 
finding ways to make sure that the work you do gets out there, gets published, gets, that, you know, uh, gets, gets, gets seen. You've laid a huge amount of traction just here, and it's happened around the country in a relatively short amount of time. Um, you know, it is a really ridiculous thing that, you know, it took 50 years for African American plays to get produced, and they all have their little fashions, a little fashion of Asian American, and now that sort of disappears and something else, you know. Um, it, partly, um, more and more, they will just be American stories, and there are a multiplicity of American stories and, and performers to uh, tell them, but it's partly, I think, in this country, just familiarity. Do you know what I mean? It's like realizing your neighbor, it's why gay marriage is gonna happen no matter what anybody pretends uh, to the contrary because everyone eventually is gonna have a neighbor who's gay who they're gonna like and then they're gonna, you know, it's familiarity. Then you want them to get married. Then they're not the other anymore. You know, the Middle East has been, been made the other in Western culture for so many thousands of years that that is a really, that's the big interesting challenge about the Middle East is, and I don't even like it that we call it the Middle East, they're totally different cultures. I hate that. You go to Turkey, it's one university. You go to Syria, it's a different. You go to Lebanon, it's a totally different history. You go to Iraq. So I'm not even sure that's so helpful, actually. I, and I, I want to say, too, I mean, what was interesting with Invasion was, um, uh, you know, it was Americanized, and that um, the translator had originally, or Jonas and Rachel had written it to me in New York, because that's where it was done first. But Efren was like, let's make this about the Bay Area. And so we got permission from the playwright to just change a few words here and there to make it relevant to us now in terms of like locations. Um, and I loved that. I loved that choice because it, it, it felt like we can't even push it off to New York. Like, well, these things have to New York on the West Coast. Um, so it was so, so um, timely, us down here in San Francisco. Um, and that does seem um, extremely um, important. Both things seem important, but um, to cultivate a, a sense of um, our own uh, engagement and culpability now here. Everett. Hello. Hi. Uh, before I ask the question, do I need the mic? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, I did the recommendation and I was a PR person for ACT when Scorch was selected, so I sort of inside or outside the question, I guess. Uh, is, I do feel like from artistic directors, it feels like on the artistic side, there's a hunger and and sort of great support of a lot of these writers. You know, we are seeing certain writers come up. Um, I'm interested in when you said to your teams, I'm going to do this Middle Eastern play, what was the reaction from the marketing people? What was the reaction from the fundraising people? And yeah. how were sales? I mean, and I don't, you know, I, that's a real question because I actually feel like until Middle Eastern plays start selling well, you know, that we want to make that next step because we you want you want to make it so that it's not as big as this uh, in a way. And I know a lot of artistic directors don't think that way, but you counter it when you bring the play out and your marketing people go, ooh, you know, or not. I, I'm like just really curious about how that interaction happens. Yeah, great question. I'll be really honest with you. It, it, it wasn't. It wasn't didn't go that well. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's just awful how sort of reductive it gets down to, you know, the, the names of things. And it's just, it's just, it's just hard. And, it, and it, it, there wasn't any real resistance. It's, it's, it's just, wow, that's gonna, that's gonna be difficult. Just because of the name of the, the play and the name of the playwright. I'm sorry, but it's just the, the truth. It's just like I, I, they're so they're so used to thinking in terms of ticket sales. And, uh, <laughs> just yeah. So that just strengthened my resolve, though. It's like, great. Well, obviously, we need to do this. So yeah, I, it's not terrible. No, this is it's good to be honest. If we're not honest, I mean. Yeah. Anybody else? Can I follow up on that one? Um, just a comment first, and then I, I kind of want to get back to the landmines and Rachel Corey question, because I, I, it's hard for me to believe that that gorilla is not in the room. But I want to tell you about 20, 25 years ago, before 9-11, Mideast only had one meaning in this country, and that was Israel and Palestine, and the conflict there. 
And it wasn't just landmines in, around you, it was bombers aimed at your head if you took off that subject. Um, which, um, I was part of a group that did that in, in the late 80s, and with enormous rewards. I mean, every Jew and Arab in, <laughs> in the Bay Area saw this play about Israel and Palestine, because they, what, they were full of so much tension about it. They wanted to, you know, they, they really flocked to this place. Um, but it's enormous. It's hard for me to believe none of you have mentioned a show that goes there or that goes to the U.S. role in Iraq. And I'm pressing the question of whether there are not boundaries, whether there are not, there are not things that would come at you if you, went at, if you touched this region in a more dangerous way. I think you're absolutely correct, Ms. Lojo. And I think that's probably, if not consciously, unconsciously why we get what Terry said, that you easier to come to a place to commune if you're talking about a personal story that's about family. Absolutely, for sure. I mean, I think there's that on the one hand. And then on the other hand, I think how many people outside of you are armed and skilled to write those kinds of pieces? I don't, I don't know. I don't know that answer because I don't know those writers, I suppose. Um, that's not a, a soft volley out of it. That's more just what I'm, I'm versing with, I know you guys in the, out here may know more people that are, are ready to die. It's hard enough to get a story in the newspapers printed about it, so I don't know how you would get people to produce those plays. I, I hear you is what I'm saying on that. And I don't know, and I think that has its trickle down then, who are the people that are skilled and crafted enough to write a skilled and crafted piece in response to that? that furthers the dialogue, or in some ways actually starts the dialogue. I think it's a great question, a question I have no answer for. I'm trying to think, I mean, we're about to do this play uh, by George Walker that's really scabrous, called Dead Metaphor, about an, Iraq, uh, uh, an American sniper who comes back from yeah. Iraq. Um, and uh, uh, I have no idea what the response is gonna be. I mean, it's not news that no, none of these veterans can get jobs in this country when they come back, and snipers are the worst in terms of employability, right? They, because they have what they call the eye, and that gift which has allowed them to rise in the military and um, kill uh, at long distance with incredible precision means that they, they are pariahs when they come back to the States. And I wanted to do this play because George Walker is such a troublemaker and such a fantastic writer, sort of in the Joan Holden vein. I mean, I think he's a writer that's probably been very much influenced by you. Um, I don't know what what I have no idea what's gonna, I, how that will land. Um, uh, and you know, in the Bay Area, we pretend that um, you know we're so we're not the ones sending people to Iraq, so we can be very liberal about it. It's not our sons, <laughs> mostly. No, seriously, you know. We are yeah. part of this project called Theater of War, and we've had two MFA students who are in Iraq right now. And when they came back and did this project, it was absolutely amazing, because it was all for, um, the point of Theater of War is that it's for veterans. And so you do a big collaboration where you get people into the audience who are veterans. And you know, I mean, that's a whole other question of who we license our wars out to in this country, and the rest of us let it go by, you know. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, we haven't even started producing those plays from an American point of view. Um, let alone an Israeli point of view. There's a wonderful, there are a bunch of Israeli writers writing about, like, um, you know, um, Monty Lerner's play, The Death of, the, the Death of Yitzhak, which we, of uh, Rabin, which, which we worked on, which the, um, you know, Jews in this town hated. It's very, very critical of the Israelis. Um, he's an amazing writer. Um, he has enough trouble getting his plays done in Israel now. Um, you know, so, I mean, part of the question is, um, we are incredibly culturally myopic in this country, you know, about all kinds of other cultures. It, it, it's not just the Middle East, you know. I suppose the Middle East, we should be less myopic because our, our, we're so involved um, there politically. But I mean, we just did a Finnish play at ACT, and, and, and everybody was like, what? A what? A what? From where? And it's Finland. You know, why was that so difficult? People thought that was incredibly peculiar. And <laughs> I would say, I mean, Scorched Arts, you were there when we 
read it. I mean, our team really adored the play, and so they really wanted to do it. They're much more nervous about other things I like. <laughs> That's another question. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. If I may ask, um, I wonder if given your respective experiences about programming, uh, what do you think has happened, not so far as the question of staging in the Middle East, the fact that Japan is concerned, but staging theater in terms of the location of theater? Uh, namely, there is a place called uh, Z-Zone, and people come here, they're invited on a sunny day or a rainy day to come here and watch their theater. Or, given uh, contemporary political events, such as Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square was not just a revolutionary space, it was a theatrical space. Mm -hmm. People were just going there to perform. Mm -hmm. Poetry, play, drama, etc. We had something of that in Zakati Park in New York, that again was an occupied space. You had, a, you had an audience already there, so the play went to the audience, or the, the audience coming. I suppose something like that must have happened in Oakland. I, I'm, I'm not from here, but I suppose. Now, in our part of the world, in the uh, Arab and Muslim world, we have a tradition of it that theater went where people were. In the bazaar, people were doing their grocery shopping, so uh, you had a, you had a uh, performance. On Friday or uh, Thursday evening, people went to the cemetery for uh, their. Uh, Loved ones, you stage Tazia right there on, on, on the cemetery. I wonder if something, I mean, also here we have situational theater, site specific theater, there are any number of uh, uh, seminocrum of sort of changing the idea of theater. Where is theater to be performed? Uh, I just wonder that in this, given this particular moment in history that we are, whether this idea of theater, here is the play that is happening, you go to buy the ticket and you come. Uh, I, I mean, last night I, I saw some fantastic plays, but there were like 12, 12 and a half people sitting in the audience. Uh, whether that needs to be re re conceptualized I'm completely with you. I'm absolutely, I think we're in the midst of, of, of weighing, experimenting, trying that very idea, I think absolutely. And it's not so far from why we would ask the question like, where are the Middle Eastern writers? I think it's in that same arena. Meaning, if the people are there, don't we need to bring the stories to the people and then the people bring the stories back to us? And yeah, absolutely. We talk about classist, racist issues, you know, theater <laughs> perpetuates it as much as any place where we have this hidden set of rules and agendas and obviously economics play into it so only a certain number of us are going to go to that thing but once you're in that thing then only you go and then we do that silly thing where we only create it for each other. I'm absolutely with you. I think we're trying to do that uh, right now. We're going to do our own next year uh, two things in, in theater spaces and the rest all along spaces from our space on Mission and Fifth up 6th Street and up Market and Gallery, Hotel Lobby, Cafe, mm -hmm. Street Corner, uh, Luggage Store, mm -hmm. Bar. I think that's right. I think there has to be something in there, right? And in, in, in the way that you're saying, in a, a basic historical alchemical way, there's obviously something there. That's what we're trying to create in this weird way in here, but it's the same idea. But then in the moment that we are in time, yeah, absolutely. Also, I think just the fact that people don't want to sit in places like this no more obviously speaks to it, so yeah, I'm with but That's such a beautiful thing that you just said that is, um, that, that is both very culturally specific and very much of now, you know, it isn't an American tradition because we're founded as a Puritan country where people didn't want playhouses anyway and you had to hide out to do theater because the theater people were prostitutes and renegades, you know. So we don't really have a tradition of public quite that way. I mean, that is such a beautiful way to put it, what you just said, that, you know, on this Thursday night everybody's at the market and then that's what they do. I mean, we, that, I'd love to see that tradition created. Um, and that would be a very particular new way of saying this is what it means to be American, you know, that, that, um, that isn't... A, a, just a, a, a commodity that people go and buy, but actually that is something that a community could do in public together. And I don't think that's particularly 
a tradition in this country. No, I think about the, the mind group, and certainly yeah. been doing that for years and years and years, yeah. and going into the park. And, but even but that's a different thing, because that's saying, we as this company are going to go into this park, yeah, and this, what, what you just said is so amazing, which is, there are times in the week where an audience is going to be in this place, mm -hmm. at this cemetery, or now this audience of everybody on Thursday night is going to be in this market, so let's figure that out, let's go there. That's kind of, um, I have to think about that. Yeah. That's fabulous. Yes, I see a hand here. I guess my question is, along the lines of audience, I know and some recently some recent notes of an artist touring in actually and domestically, usually the audience is a small, but the community comes out for a month, and the response a lot is, I didn't know that, I didn't know that, I didn't know that, about the culture that's being shown in the play. So I guess my question for you is, as you talk about seeing the show, there's a small audience, and the marketing scenario you described actually doesn't apply to us. The, the thing of the review comes out and then you're back. We, we were actually, the newspapers could die tomorrow and I don't think I'd see any difference. We were actually word of mouth, old fashioned, real word of mouth is still the most powerful tool and uh, I depend on it enormously and, and, and it actually works. Uh, it's, I, I love it actually. It's, I actually feel like there's a real conversation going on within the, the community and between them and us. And it's pretty great. So that's, that's I was really thing. happy during Scorch to see who did come, but I was also unhappy at who didn't come in the sense mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it did really well as, as our place go. But, uh, and, and because of um, Lila uh, Tariff on our board and other um, Lebanese friends of mine and Iraqi friends of mine, I, you know, I tried to figure out um, groups and ways and dialogue and there are people who, who knew about it um, but you know theater is such a marginal art form, a marginal thing in most people's lives that by the time four weeks have gone by and it's done people in their communities and their schools and their this and their that are just hearing about it um, if it's not something you're already looking for so and forget the review you know they're not reading the chronicle and saying should I go to this play they're not even thinking about going to a play period so it is a really different thing to think about to different kinds of audiences and uh, where do you go how do you how do you build those bridges you know um, we, we tried to do lots and lots of post play things early on with lots of different kinds of people and then encourage them to go out and find people and come back um, but as with anything you have to do a lot of it mm -hmm. it doesn't help to do it one time I, I know this now watching Electra, you know, because I do a lot of Greeks, and the first time we did Greeks, I got these letters from the audience before they even saw it saying, we hate Greek tragedy. <laughs> I said, really? And when have you seen it? I, you know, they think it's people in slips or something walking around. I don't know what they thought. Now we've done a lot of it. And now they're like, they know it's fierce and argumentative and litigious and loud and complicated and big women doing um, dangerous things. So. Now they turn up, but that's eight plays later. That's the problem that you're talking about is yeah. it's volume. I mean, you have to do enough. And you have to reach out more than once. Yeah. It can't, you know, it can't be, I mean, for, for you know, for us, yeah. also, you know, having one show, it's like, great, let's, let's keep going. Because it's not a, like, remember eight years ago when we did this one show? Like, hope you guys will come back. Right. <laughs> 
Okay, we have just one more question. Hello, I'm Roberta Lowe. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I just want to follow up on what Carrie, you just said about um, uh, more is more in this particular situation. <laughs> And uh, I want to thank everybody on the panel because what you what you revealed is both um, your ease and your comfort and your thoughtfulness, but also um, some of the questions that do contextualize presenting this work, both here in a beautiful liberal community like San Francisco, and nationally, where some of the where some of the issues are more complicated, and, and the nation is struggling, like. The NEA has a program to bring a Pakistani company into a rural community in Nebraska. And the veterans issues, and the Israeli-Palestinian issues, and the funding issues. The fact that um, there is less money given to Middle Eastern exchange than any other international exchange in the entire uh, US uh, foundation and government budgets. Isn't that it's so strange? Um, so there are issues of funding, there are issues of marketing, there are issues of translation, there are issues of building some kind of a community of um, uh, allies. And um, many, 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 many thousand million kudos to Golden Thread Productions for being one of maybe three theater companies, or is it five, I don't know, but I mean it's a very small handful of companies around the country who are who are developing the work, developing the artists, developing the work, share, discovering the connections. Just this morning, new people that we're meeting. So, do you don't have orders? Yes, we have a tiny role to play uh, in that, but I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody, to Durant for doing these reorient forums, and to say more, more, more. So how is more, more, more going to happen? And um, uh, if, if there's some kind of, you know, without borders is big on collectivism, and um, you know, staying in connection to develop more, and more, and more, so that there's national advocacy for funding, for raising these questions. Because you guys have now had this positive experience, and many companies around the country would not feel so comfortable and so confident. And so you're now, you know, you're now people who can share those stories as well as ever be there. So I just wanted to say thank you. Last closing comments? Come see the play. <laughs> I just said, okay, I'm throwing down my gauntlet because I love the Berta so much. You know, I, and I didn't go, I was a bad girl and didn't go last week to the TCG Fall Forum on Diversity because I never want to have that conversation again. Because I thought, <laughs> supposing we said, forget these general conversations at TCG, you're not allowed to go to the conference unless you, let's say, the Fall Forum was just on Middle Eastern drama. You couldn't go until you read these 10 plays. Everyone can read some plays on the plane, but you have to have read the plays. And then you're going to go and talk about those specific plays. No general conversation about wouldn't it be nice if there was inclusion, um, but uh, something really specific. And then we do a whole one with Roberta on Ugandan work, and we really wrestle with those incredible artists with whom we've been collaborating. Or uh, then we do Finland and Sweden. But I mean, I don't know any other way around it. I think it's a huge problem that, you know, you only get to know other cultures by either going there, reading the material, meeting somebody who works on the material, and committing to doing it yourself. I don't know any other way to do it. It's trench work. That's how it is, right? That's international collaboration. That's how anything happens. It's one-on-one, -on -one and they, but you have to make the commitment. And we spend, we waste untold hours at all of these, sorry, I don't even mean to be looking at you, but TV and TV, it's like, if we didn't do, if like we weren't allowed, we could permit ourselves for the next five years to do conferences where we had general, no conferences on marketing ever again, and we don't have to talk about social media, and we don't have to talk about inclusion, we actually have to learn something. How about we make a commitment to that? That's my All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you to all the panelists for a very helpful working panel. Last round of applause. Thank you. So we have a very brief 10 minute break. Uh, I invite you to stretch your legs and enjoy some more uh, coffee. Uh, but please be back in, in 10 minutes, uh, which is when we will be presenting the Middle East America New Plays Initiative Award, followed by Yusuf El Gindi's uh, staged reading. And um, a little later tonight, the uh, committee.